the Terhune University, where he teaches anti-bullying and kidnap prevention summer camps. He has a black belt with over 30 years of training and took fourth place in the National Karate Championships. Um, he provides public safety presentations and um, situational awareness, Cooper's color code that I learned about this morning, and more. He travels to universities, schools, government agencies, churches, detention centers to inspire others, and his traumatic birth led him to a condition called Erb's palsy. He began acting and modeling to empower young people to pursue their passion, and yes, y'all are young, and so hopefully you'll feel, in, feel inspired to pursue your passion after you hear it. Emmett believes that different does not mean inferior. This former social worker turned school, turned, uh, school assemblies into concerts by fusing pop culture with subject matter from academia. He uses his unique writing ability to tell stories. His poetry is so emotional powerful that audiences have been led to shed tears within seconds of his delivery. Please welcome Mr. Shankar. I'll turn the other two. I'll do the little bit different. Well, Patriots, how are you today? Good. good. All right, I like the energy. Very good. I love the energy in the room. Okay. Real quick, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself before I get to the uh, part of my uh, speech. Um, before I do that, I kind of want to check the temperature of the room. Um, what year are you graduating? One more year. One more year, okay. What's okay. your major? I'm a vocation. We take band. If I pass the, the state test, mm -hmm. then I keep going. If not, I have to wait until I pass the state test. Okay. How about you? Uh, class 2023 for the freshman. Okay. And your major? Civil engineering. Uh, I'll also do construction management. Construction management as well. Excellent. And you, sir? Uh, I'm a graduate this fall. I'm a uh, construction manager. Awesome, awesome. Very good. And you, ma'am? I am a business major, and I've got, after this semester, three more hours until I graduate. Uh, graduate in May. Go for it, go for it. And you, sir? I graduate uh, 2022. Excellent. And your major? Construction Construction management. Construction management. Awesome, awesome. Okay, very good, very good. My name is Emmett Schenkel. I'm an inspirational speaker with the Self-Defense Consultancy. So what that is, um, I go to schools, churches, correctional facilities, and I share lots of different content to empower and inspire people and also keep people safe. So when we talk about the address of success, what do you mean? The pill box? No, it's not a tangible address. It's an intangible address. The address of success is first interview, I want you to flip it, take the pressure off of you and put it on them. The employer has the opportunity to hire you. You are the best and the brightest at what you do. So that address of success, you embody that, you exude that. You study, you go into class, you put in the hours, you make the grades, you sacrifice two, four years of your life. Now it's time for the payoff. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of my story real quick, and we're going to talk about some key points at the end, okay? So this is a condition called Herb's palsy. Different from cerebral palsy, there's about four or five different kinds of palsies. What this means is I was trapped inside of my birth canal, and my mother, they weren't able to actually deliver me. They pulled, they couldn't get me out. Pulled, to no avail. Pulled, couldn't get me out. They finally were able to deliver me, and my mom and dad got the worst news ever. The doctors told them that, um, unfortunately, your son has had an extremely traumatic birth. Uh, the probability of him actually surviving through the night is highly unlikely. We, we don't see him living past 24 hours. Statistically, it's, it just doesn't look good. It's no longer in our hands and uh, we will be praying for you and your family at this time. So after my mom and dad heard that, I'm pretty sure they did what most moms and dads would do. I'm pretty sure they began to cry and try to console each other through those heavy tears. And at one point, they began to pray. They began to pray to God for a miracle. And God gave me a wonderful miracle. The doctor 
Hawkins also says, a little small caveat that says that if he does survive through the night, he'll probably be mentally challenged. Taking care of him is going to be extremely expensive. When he goes to school, he won't be able to keep up with the other kids. His brain is not like other kids' brains. When the teacher explains one, two, threes, and ABCs, they'll have to go back and teach it to him again because he So when I graduated high school, I wanted to make my mother proud. And my English teacher asked me one day, Emmett, I need you to write a poem for me. I was like, okay, yeah, sure. At that point, I thought all poetry had to rhyme. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dr. Seuss in the building, y'all. <laughs> so I wrote some poetry, and she said, a couple weeks go by, congratulations, Emmett, you're now a published author. Handed me a book with my name in it. Like 16, 17 years old. I was like, okay, wow, cool, cool. Maybe I'll try this poetry thing out a little bit more. So a friend of mine, one of my therapists, uh, gave me a clipping of a newspaper article. They have these huge poetry contests. People from all over the world come and compete. People from China, Brazil, Indonesia, Africa, all over the world that come and compete for these poetry competitions. I was like, all right, cool, cool. So I look at the registration, it's $600. Plus airfare, hotel travel, all that stuff. So you're looking like sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars. So I was like, well, I'm a broke college student, at 18, 19 years old. I got it. I'll write poetry and then I'll go to churches and I'll have people donate money. And it worked. It worked the first time, the second time, the third time, it kept working. Finally I said, okay, you know, you've had your fun. It's time to grow up and be a man. You need to go to school. You need a degree, and you need to get a job. That's what you need to do. You need to get your life together. So that's what I thought I needed to do. So I decided to build one more poetry competition. I did the same strategy. Do my poems, practice in churches, and it worked. I called and booked all my hotel reservations, booked everything all on my own. 24 hours later, I get a call from uh, some guy named Chad. Hello, this is Chad with such and such hotels. And I speak with Emmett, please. Yes, it's him. He says, yes, uh, there was a glitch made yesterday. Um, apparently, you're not old enough. In Texas, yes, you're considered an adult, but here we have gambling laws because we're a gambling state, and we're not going to be able to hold your room. We're just notifying you as a courtesy, unless you can come up with a chaperone. We're sorry on our part. And I was like, oh, man, are you serious? All these people that gave me all this money to support me. Oh my God, I let my mom down, I let them down. This is, oh man, I, oh God, I can't believe this. So, kid you not, within five to six hours, my sister just calls me out of the blue, totally random. She said, hey, what's going on, little brother? How are you? I was like, uh, all right. She said, whoa, what's going on with that? Uh, well, I just found out I'm going to have to cancel my trip. Go to uh, compete for this last poetry competition. Why not? She said, I said, I'm not old enough. She said, I got some time. I'll fly out from Anchorage, Alaska, and I'll be your chaperone. I said, okay, cool. So the trip was back on. So the first day we get there, we're in this nice, huge room. It's about like 100 chairs in there, 30 people. I wait for my name to be called. I go around the big old table, and I put my poem right here on this giant podium, right? And I set my poem down. And I read my poetry, I'm going through it and everything. I give them a taste, I give them a little bit. I give them my whole effort and energy. At the end, everybody politely clapped. It's all good, okay, cool. I walk out, and when I get ready to leave, they give me an envelope. It says, congratulations, you have qualified for the semifinals. So I'm going to be here at nine o'clock tomorrow morning for the second day of competition. So this is great. The second day of competition, me and my sister are there. There, 845. Okay. Wait for my name to get called. Same thing. I come around the big table, giant podium right here. 
nice and safe. Nobody can see your movements behind the podium. They can't see anything. They can't see your legs shaking. So I'm covered. I'm good. I'm so good right now. I'm in the zone right now. Put the form down. Do the form. A little bit more gusto. A little bit more energy. And after I'm finished, they want me to wipe the claps. Walk out the room, get another envelope. Join us for our gala from 6 to 8 p.m. So they had everybody there that night. They had the Rockettes. They had the lady from the Baby Brady Bunch was there, Florence Henderson. Some of you guys don't know who that is, but she's <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah. So they had everyone there. It was a very nice gala. And they had all kinds of food, fancy three course meals, all these different forks. I'm from East Texas, and I'm, my skin is, is black. I'm African American in origin, but I'm a little bit of a redneck. Because when I see three forks, closest one, that's the one that gets used. I don't care if it's a solid dessert or meal, that's, yeah, you don't need all these. Yeah, I don't need all that, I just give you the, yeah, I'm good. So, <laughs> I'm sure I embarrassed my mom <laughs> and my uh, pastor as well that day. So I am focused on this cheesecake during the dessert portion. So they started handing out desserts, they had German chocolate cake and cheesecake. And right about then the announcer said, and now the moment you've all been waiting for, they start calling out the top 20 courts from around the world to compete head to head. I could care less. They said cheesecake. Say what? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. We, this is going down. We're gonna get some cheesecake. Okay, okay. So I get my cheesecake, and I didn't even hear my name called. My sister heard my name called. She said, "Damn it, they called your name," and she she nudged me when she pushed me. <laughs> and uh, when she pushed me, I was like, "Whoa, whoa, from the brakes." Do not interrupt me when I'm eating my cheesecake, lady. We talked about this. Come on, big sis. Really? I wanted to say it. That was my intent. <laughs> so I take myself at least 10 minutes to tra traverse the other side of this room. That's how massive this coliseum is. Huge, big. They had a giant red curtain that seemed to go on forever. Big stage. The big cameras that they use to film the NFL football games. One of those was standing there. They had track lining in the ceiling, little slivers of blue like the ocean. Massive room, massive, massive. So I walk around there, I finally get backstage. I don't think the event coordinators knew how big this was gonna be. The next thing I know, I have a small army of people asking me for an autograph. The only word that I can understand was autograph. They were from around the world. China, Japan, Russia, Poland very heavy accents. Can I have your autograph? Can I have your autograph? That kind of freaked me out just a little bit because I'm like, okay, signing autographs left and right, left and right. They didn't even know my name 24 hours ago, but now I'm signing autographs as well by the celebrity thing. So I was like, oh, this is, started getting nervous. So I was quoting them 14. So I called my name and I'm getting ready to walk out there and take a four steps, go up the steps, I turn the corner right in front of me, I've seen something that I've, I've never seen before in my life. It was one lone microphone with a bright white light shining down on it. And I got just a little bit scared because if you remember the first two days, I put my poetry on the podium. I had a lecture and I had something I could put the phone down because I didn't have to memorize. Life will happen right here, right now. Life will happen to you like that. All of a sudden, I had zero time to prepare. I read that poem as fast as I could, trying to imprint it into my brain. And I set it down gingerly. And I looked at the audience, and I got ready to speak. And all of a sudden, I realized that this microphone is so expensive, they can actually hear the breath that I'm breathing. Giant screen the size of a billboard, and 
I see myself on that giant screen. And then that corner spoke to me again and said, you sister. flesh versus the spirit. See, I wanted to show what people really feel like. They don't say how mad they are at God. So I used this basically as a uh, visual aid. And I wanted to show what it's like to be angry. So that first line is like, how could you curse me with this thing? And I get angry and I get loud, full out of railing against God. Angry for what he did to me. Because I know somebody in that audience has been more angry than I've ever been. They blame God because their mom's not here anymore. They hate God for whatever reason. There's so much anger out there, so I wanted to embody that during the flesh part. And then I transitioned fluidly to the spirit, the calmness and the tranquil part. Dear God, how could you curse me with this thing? My son, I've given you a song to sing. So we go back and forth, back and forth to me. I symbolically open my eyes toward the end of the poem when I realize that God's got me. I don't have to work that hard anymore. I can, I can do this. He's got me. He's got me. And that's all good and all is well with my soul. So I open my eyes at the end of that poem. The worst thing that could happen to the public speaker happened to me. No, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't move. That, that means the thing. I'm not going to mess with what I handle that. Objection won't handle that. Dead silence. There was no clapping, there was no babies crying, everybody stopped eating, everybody, everybody in the audience had the same look on their face like, <laughs> and nobody moved. And the, the weird thing about it, I noticed something, no matter what country they were from, everybody had one thing in common. They all had tears streaming down their eyes. And then all of a sudden, I realized, I said, I must have did really bad. I started beating myself up. I said, oh my God, this is a horrible poem. I swear I'll never speak in public again. I'm glad this is the last poem in competition because I am horrible. I just, I said, wait a minute. I wonder if they know that I'm actually through speaking, I'm through with the poem. So I leaned to the microphone and I said two words. Thank you. So next thing I know, a table of 10 stand up. Another team, another table, another table, another team, another table. I got a standing ovation from a record-breaking crowd of thousands of people from around the world. The MC comes out on stage and says, congratulations, Emmett, and he hands me a check for $10,000. First thing I did being from East Texas, whoa, hey, you're throwing too many numbers, may slow down, hold on, one, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're good. <laughs> thank you, thank you, y'all come out, I'm at the end, we'll see you, we'll be back next year. I had to count and make sure because it was a surreal moment for me. Because I had no idea how powerful my story was and how it was going to affect change with people. I had no idea. And you have the same power in you. That's why you're here. It's to grow and cultivate that. All right? So, long story short, I did manage to make my mom proud. And I, when I reflect back on it, the happiest moment wasn't when he came out on stage and gave me the check for $10,000. The happiest moment was hearing my mom's voice. My sister called her, and we were side by side on the phone, and I heard my mama, I knew you could do it. I knew you could do it, baby. And she just screamed it out like Mariah Carey, you know? And I was like, wow, that's that's one of my all-time favorite memories for me, okay? Now, things that I want you to learn and think about <coughs> closing my speech, I want you to remember what your why is. Are you doing this for yourself? Are you doing this for your kids? Are you doing it for your mom, for your dad? Are you doing this because you want to help somebody you never met before? Are you doing it for the greater good? Whatever it is, write it down and make sure you look at it once a day, twice a day, three times a day. The second thing I want you to consider is adjusting your routine. When it comes down to success, and pursuing success, you're going to have to adjust your routine. So if I have a habit of, I don't know, sleeping in until 10 o'clock, I'm 
not saying that I can't be successful. But if I was up at six o'clock and I was getting things done, I think I'd be more effective. That's just me. So I would have to remove that habit, cut it, or replace it with another one and get up at six o'clock in the morning. Do my physical exercise in my body and do my mental exercise of exercise in my brain, reading and studying the greatest speakers of the world. That's, that's my job. It's not anybody else's job but mine. See, I can drop down and do 100 push-ups. That's no problem. But it doesn't benefit anybody in the room. I can't ask this man to do push-ups for me on my behalf. I can't ask this young lady to go run two miles for my benefit. That, that, that's how that works. So you always have to put in your own work. So you got to adjust your routine when it comes to success. Okay? The last thing I want you to take away, and we'll move into the questions. The last thing I want you to take away is I want you to make sure that you make time to meditate on what you are grateful for. You got to meditate on what you're grateful for because when you don't feel like taking the test, when you go to the fourth interview and they still won't hire you, oh God. when they let you go, when your whole department is cut, whatever the situation is, you want to remember what you're grateful for. It's easy to be distracted by stress, by complaints and things of that nature. So you have to remember, you gotta focus your mind on this. Some people, they wanna blame other people. Other people, they wanna bless other people. And right there in the middle, there's a big old thing called distraction. So the people that wanna blame people, they consume distraction. It's like a symbiotic relationship. They consume everything that is distracting and they find things to complain about and all that stuff. The people that want to bless people, they abstain. They're very austere when it comes to consuming the news all the time. Oh my gosh, uh, another scandal. Now, now, if you're going to inspire people, if you want to be focused on what you're here to do, you can't do what other people do. If you want to be the best in class, best in the world, that's easy. Look what the crowd is doing, go the other way. It's just that simple. You look what the crowd is doing and go the other way. And they have a name for that, that's called leaders. It's perfectly fine with that. So you want to find something to be grateful for, whatever it is. If you think one of them are, you can find something to be grateful for. Before I close out, I want to open the floor for some questions from the audience. And um, I do have a prize for the first person that asks a question. There he is. <laughs> All right. My man. Easy. So what did you do in speech competition? I did a poem. Well, it was two minutes. It was in when? Like, when did you go? Over? That was, oh my gosh, 2000 and, no, no, it was 1999. So are you a, just got out of high school, you just started college? Mm -hmm. So like. To you in that moment, being the star of that, did that influence you to become a public speaker because of that interaction and that reaction back? Or was it due because of the fact that you had a God-given ability to just be it's, open and extroverted about that? It's a little bit of both, and I'm so glad that you asked that question because I never shared this. I shared this in the first session, but not the second session. I went to the school, and, and I thought that because I had a nice four-year degree from the University of Texas at Tyler, that I would have all the jobs and people would interview me left and right. I could pick and choose. And I was gonna make all this money and I'm gonna help people and save the world. Seven years I went on interviews and get hired. Seven years I modified my resume. Just listen. Seven years, well, you don't have enough relevant experience. I see you can work here, you got some volunteer hours here. All right, I'm just not gonna have like that. <coughs> so to answer your question, I've been doing public speaking for a while. East Texas, born and raised, you go to a black church, you have these Easter Sunday speeches. Being a little terrified like that, yeah, the number one fear in the world back then in the 80s was called glossophobia, fear of public speaking. Uh, currently today, that has been bumped down by um, obviously several headlines and several things on uh, mainstream news. Um, but for me, my innate ability to speak, I credit that to my mother and my grandmother. My grandmother was poetry. I write poetry, and I use my poetry um, to inspire students when I go to schools and colleges. So 
some of the poetry sounds like rap, but it's a little different. Rhythmic. Yes, uh, it's rhythmic, but. Getting the cadence to when you, when you yes. play poetry. The cadence, the vocabulary, the five syllable words uh, infused. One of your boys, like when you got, yes. when you got mad and threw them in the brunch too, yeah. to show emotion. Yeah, I used to do a lot of public speaking too, that's why I love yeah. public speaking. This yeah. is why I, I love just like seeing how other people speak, mm -hmm. how they deliver their content. Mm -hmm. um, like even like just like, you know, comedians, things like that, how they deliver their content, what their messages get across. Right. You know, um, so I appreciate what you want to say. It's very well, well said. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever put your poetry to music? That's the second person to ask me that today. Wow. I'm going to start working on it. <laughs> you know, the universe is speaking, but are you listening? Are you hearing? Yeah. Um, I have had opportunities, and I did have a situation where I was fun, so I've got to let the past go and put it into the sea of forgiveness. So I do have a book coming out. It's called Invisible Reflections. So I'm gonna have this collection of 20 poems there, and I'll be putting that out uh, soon later this year. So you can buy your copies. It'll be on Amazon and other places like that. Well, you, can, you can tell your poetry with like a very just drum beat behind, nothing crazy. Like you know, cajon is those drum boxes you can sit on top of, which has a snare and a bass sound, but you're just gonna beat on the sides okay. while telling the lines of what you have to say. Cool. Yeah. I know that'd be kind of cool for what you, what you would do. Okay. Um, cool. All right. Um, well, actually. Do I have time for, okay. If you're uh, gonna do a poem. I yes. was gonna say, I think you were asking me for a poem or something. Uh, real quick. Don't you wanna hear him do one? I'll, I'll give yeah, you a I'll hear it. Short, well, okay. I don't wanna take away from the other speaker's time. Right. You can have my time. Very concise. You can have my time. <laughs> <laughs> I did one earlier, so I'll do a different one. Um, my freestyle ain't free. When I spit balls, they call it poetry. Follow me as I take you to your leader. No 40 ounce flow here, I kick knowledge by the leecher. Now when I increase to the gallon, you can find me on Jimmy Fallon. See, I'm hot like that fire, that's that thermogenesis. The epidemic of ignorance is my nemesis. Empower other people, that's my emphasis. In the dark, I move towards the stillness. People will always fear your realness. You must learn to put yourself first and not last. Surround yourself with people that have class. Tough times never last, but tough people do. That's Robert Schuller, and it's nothing new. So you stop when you get tired, I stop when I'm done. I'm here to work and you're here to have fun because I'll give it to you straight by chapter and verse. You don't even know the book, man, that's the worst. DM to the author of pain in my life so you thought you had me think twice. I am the architect of this word that is spoken. My poetry has a bazinga because it be smoking. Off the page, I'm no sage. Warrior wisdom, this I am. All day like Kanye, what up fam? So your best shot can't even get near me. I live my life by example, exemplary. Free from a cage of rage, precision as I pack the stage. Savage with this mic in hand. Yeah, baby, I'm a classic man. Before the song, I knew right from wrong. I stay clean like I just left the haberdashery. It's a dirty game, so I'm dastardly. But only when I have to be, I change the game so they don't have to be happy. Paraplexes is a Freudian slip of the tongue. Believe me when I say you don't want none. I flip the script and pull the lever. A few rhymes are ever this clever. My ending is your beginning, so this like a drop. Just know one thing. I can't stop this thing. Awesome. <laughs>